Welcome into OutKick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. Appreciate all of you coming to join me on this lovely Friday afternoon. My, 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 what a week it has been. This show is presented by Odd Shark. Go to Odd Shark for all of your gambling and informational related needs. Let's go ahead and begin with the spectacular, amazing, unbelievable stories that emerged from last night's NFL draft. A lot of stuff that I talked about, a lot of stuff that I hit on this morning on Outkick the Coverage. You can go listen to the show from this morning and go download the podcast. Uh, several thoughts that I have. Um, one, this is something that's not going to surprise any of you. I think that any piling on that's going on on the Chicago Bears, the Kansas City Chiefs, or the Houston Texans for their moves to get Mitch Trubisky, uh, Patrick Mahomes, and... Deshaun Watson are absurd. This is absolutely, no doubt at all, a move that could make sense. We don't know. We don't know how good those guys are going to be at the quarterback position. I think that uh, all three of these guys could end up being great. Again, I don't know. But every year you should go in and try to draft a quarterback. If you don't have a quarterback, the Bears don't really have a quarterback. Certainly the Texans don't. The Chiefs don't have one who they can win a Super Bowl with. I am in zero doubt that that's a solid decision. Uh, Bama players. How about Bama players plummeting? Did anybody believe that Marlon Humphrey at 16 was going to be the first Bama player to go? Jonathan Allen plummets down the line. The San Francisco 49ers get an absolute steal with Reuben Foster at 31. But how about John Lynch? Maybe he knows a little bit about how to work the draft. He trades back to three and then jumps back up in the draft and gets Reuben Foster. I can't believe that that was considered to be a deal-breaking occurrence. I thought it was ridiculous. The Raiders. They draft Gary on Conley. Leave it to the Raiders to go draft a guy who's still under investigation for sexual assault. Is there a more perfect first draft pick as the Oakland Raiders than to go draft a guy who tries to pick up a girl in an airport, I mean, sorry, in a hotel elevator at 3 a.m. and then immediately request that she be a part of a foursome? I don't know how much more Vegas you can get than that. The Titans picks. I really like the Titans picks. They took big swings. They believe in Corey Davis. And they also believe in Adore Jackson. Those were both their points of need. They need a great wide receiver. They haven't had one in a long time. It's been the curse of the Titans ever since they passed on Randy Moss and took Kevin Dyson instead. The number one overall receiver in the draft on their board was Corey Davis. I love it. Marcus Mariota, you know, is a top 10 quarterback. At least those of us who have watched him play so far in the first two seasons know it. You finally give him a weapon. Nobody knows Rashard Matthews, but he now becomes a solid number two. You toss that out there with uh, with who you got in the fifth round last year. You got Delaney Walker. You got two solid running backs. Really good bookend tackles. This is a team that should be pretty outstanding on the offensive side of the ball. On Adore Jackson, great punt returner who can play at times on offense and at, at times has looked like he was going to be an absolute lockdown of a cornerback there for years to come. He reminds me of Pac-Man Jones without the felonies. I like that they got him at 18. Uh, Jets and Browns pass on quarterbacks as do the 49ers. I'm curious to see what they're going to do in the second round. It could be the beginning of the sweepstakes to try to end up with Sam Darnold. We'll see whether or not that is going to be the case. Uh, The Eagles, solid pick with Derek Barnett. Absolutely zero risk. That guy's going to be a double sack, a double digit sack guy, I believe, for years to come. The SEC with 12 picks overall. Tied for the most in the history of the NFL draft. While they may have only had one team that went better than 9-4, and four, that was Bama who went 14-1 and one last year. I also really like the decision to get uh, Jameis Winston, O.J. Howard. Thought that they are now stacked at the offensive position, skill positions for Tampa Bay. Thought that was a really good move. I liked Ingram to the Giants. I think you consider all the different options that Eli Manning is going to have throwing the football. I like all of those. Now for the ridiculousness. Garrett Bowles, who scored a 9 on the Wonderlick, was drafted by the Denver Broncos. He's 25 years old. He brought out his baby, and he said of his 3- or 4-month-old baby, he's going to remember this for the rest of his life. You, sir, are an idiot. Now I see how you scored a 9 on the Wonderlick. And let's not forget our boy, uh, hold on, Fournette and McCaffrey go at 4-8. and I think for those of us who are big college football fans, this is going to be a major tipping point. Most top number one draft picks and probably second and third round draft picks as well are going to start sitting out of the NFL draft. Everybody said, oh, 
these guys at four and eight, they're never going to get. Uh, they're going to get this, uh, the McCaffrey and Fournette. The NFL is going to hold it against them if they don't play in the bowl game. Instead, guess who didn't get picked? Dalvin Cook, who played in the bowl game and played really, really well against Michigan. He's still out there waiting. Meanwhile, Leonard Fournette at four, Christian McCaffrey at eight. If I were advising players, or if I had a son who was actually good at football, I would say unless you are in the playoff, there is no way on earth that you should try and go out and play in this game. It just makes no sense. It makes absolutely zero sense. So uh, those are the big stories. My favorite story. How about our boy Takaris McKinley who walked out with a photo of his grandma at the NFL stage. Now I don't know what happened here. I think Twitter was afraid to make fun of the black guy who had a black grandma. If this had been a white dude with a white grandma Twitter would have come undone. I was like the only guy who was actually willing to make fun of this. One of the all-time most ridiculous moves we've ever seen in the history of the NFL draft. Not only did he bring out the photo of Grandma, this massive blown up photo of her in like a glamour shots church photography solo photo. He also then dropped a goddamn and a fucking live on television and, uh, and totally managed to make himself look like an idiot. As if that weren't enough, today he's flying private back to Atlanta and he took the picture on the plane with him and posed for it again. I just have so many questions about this. In your own life. This is like sign that nobody's friends with this dude. Because if you're really good friends with this dude then you would sit down with him just like if you, all I do is make fun of my guy friends, right? Any decision that any guy friend I have makes is totally up for ridicule. If I had come to you guys, let's just pretend I had come to you guys and I would said, guys, big news for me. I'm going to be broadcasting live with a national, tele- national radio show at the Super Bowl this year. I told my grandma before she died that I was going to be taking her picture with me to the Super Bowl because one day I was going to have a national radio show. And if I had traveled down to Houston and carried that picture and set it beside me and you'd gotten a picture of me and I had tweeted it out and it had just been me sitting next to a huge life-size photo of my grandmother, you'd be like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Right? Nobody hates the grandmas. All right, let me put this on the record clearly as I did this morning. I love grandmas more than you. Grandma is the least criticized member of the family than anybody, right? You might say bad things about dad. You might say bad things about mom, brother, sister. Least criticized. I want to toss this out there. Least criticized member of the family beyond a shadow of a doubt, grandma. I've never heard anybody say, my grandma is a total asshole. I've never heard somebody say, you know what? My grandma is such a bitch. I can't stand that cunt. Like, have you ever heard anybody call their grandma a cunt? Ever in the life history of the world has anybody been like, my grandma is a total cunt. So, so, let's be honest. Grandma never insulted. Most praised member of the family across the board. I love grandmas. I love your grandma even more than you love your grandma. I hate cancer more than you. I hate death more than you. But everybody's grandma is going to die. All right? Unless somebody's grandma is immortal, unless they are a super whole, super uh, superhero, nobody is ever going to survive forever. So the fact that he made this decision to honor his grandma by carrying out her picture is patently absurd. All right? He could have made the decision. Maybe I'll take a wallet size photo. Maybe I'll take an 8x10, which is still weird. Maybe I'll just wear a bracelet that reminds me of my grandma. Maybe I'll wear her old necklace around my neck and tap it every time I make a tackle and every time when I get drafted. This was really, really weird behavior by this dude McKinley who was drafted by the Atlanta Falcons and even more of an indictment for McKinley. Nobody. Nobody on his friends. Nobody on his team. Nobody said, bro, don't take that big picture of your grandma to the draft and walk across the stage with it. You're going to look like an idiot. And if you do do it, Don't then goddamn us and fuck us live on television for everybody out there to go see it. One of the most questionable decisions in the history of the draft, and I've seen a lot of questionable fashion decisions, one of the most questionable decisions, how do you travel with that thing? Dude lives in California. So did he travel all the way across the country carrying a picture of his grandma through the airport? Did he go through security with that thing? Did he put it through a metal detector? Did he buy it its own seat? Because I don't think it would fit in the overhead bin. Did he ship the picture to himself? in his hotel in Philadelphia in advance? Did he get there, print off the picture, get a new frame, and pull it out? I have so many questions. It was a massive freaking photo. And I've said this on the show earlier. I don't trust you if you have a family photo like that in your dorm room to begin with. Did you have a picture of your family in your dorm room? I didn't. I know who my family is. I I, I went to college. I went to law school. I don't ever remember having pictures of my family up all over the place. If I walk, Think about how funny this would be. A lot of you are in college right now. If you walked into one of your buddies', uh, buddies dorm rooms 
And on the wall beside his bed, he had a blown up picture of his grandma dressed up for church by herself. What would you say? If you don't immediately ridicule the guy to the end of the earth, that's like the funniest possible, by the way, idea I could ever think of. One of the most absurd situations I've ever thought of is, what if I just had a huge picture of it, like, and if for women, how uncomfortable would you be if you were sleeping with a guy and his grandma's picture was on the wall? What about that guy when he jerks off? Somebody tweeted me about that. How do you jerk off with a picture of your grandma beside your bed? Oh, here I am jerking off, and there's grandma in her Sunday finery just looking right down on me. And if you're a girl, how do you get climb on top of a dude in college and start riding him when right on your side, like you turn over and grandma's right there in her Sunday finery looking at you? The best way to guarantee that nobody ever sleeps with you is to put a picture of your grandma in her Sunday clothes on the wall beside your bed. This dude has made really bad decisions. Really bad decisions. Uh, we turned that picture, several listeners did, into grandmama. Then people started tweeting us pictures of themselves with big pictures of their grandmas on their chests as they went out to work in the morning. It was utterly fabulous. Just extraordinary. So, fantastic. Uh, maybe she's a grandma I'd like to fuck. Who knows? Maybe she's a gilf. Uh, let's continue to, uh, to roll again. He de dude doesn't have a single friend. Dude doesn't have a single friend who talks to him honestly because if you said right now, you said right now to your friends, no matter what you do, no matter what y'all do for a living, in your own life, you know what I'm going to do this year? I'm going to sign my first contract when I get out of college and then the first day of work I'm going to take a picture of my grandma because I told her, you know what grandma, one day I'm going to be an engineer. One day I'm going to be a sports writer. One day I'm going to be a doctor. One day I'm going to be a lawyer. Would you trust your doctor? If you went into a doctor's office and your doctor was about to operate and he said, clapped his hands, and he said, you know, like broke, cracked his knuckles and he said, today, my first day to ever remove an appendix. But I want you to know how important this first day is. I brought this huge life-size photo of my grandma. She's dead now because I told her one day, Grandma, I'm going to be a doctor. And when I'm a doctor, I'm going to bring you into the OR with me. We're going to anesthetize this picture. We're going to have it right up against the wall when I cut into somebody and take out their appendix. Would you be like, this motherfucker's not cutting me? Right then and there, you'd be like, I'm out. All right, I appreciate Understand that you love your grandma. No offense intended. I understand that grandma is the least criticized member of the family. Nobody loves grandmas more than me. I'm number one on the grandma power ranking love list. Number one is Clay Travis. I love your grandma more than you love your grandma. That's how high I am on the list. Nobody's higher. But would you not say, I'm not going to let this dude operate on me? If you went into a law firm, if you went into a law firm and walked into a lawyer's office, and the only thing he had on the wall was a picture of his grandma in her Sunday finery blown up all huge on the wall. Would you trust that lawyer to file a lawsuit for you? I wouldn't. I'm out. So, this is a questionable decision that is indefensible about every single angle we could possibly go. As much as I love grandmas, and shout out to your grandma, if she's still living, I love her. If she's dead, she knows that I, at her time of death that Clay Travis loved her more than anybody else. If there is a single grandma listening to this right now, just want you to know, nothing against the grandmas of the world. I love y'all more than anybody. But that, my friend, is the absolute truth. All right, so share this. If you like this element, that's why you got to ridicule people. And people say, oh, a couple people, of course, on Twitter are like, oh, this is racist of you. It's racist. Here's the deal. I don't give a damn what color you are. If you do something dumb, I ridicule you. See, most people tiptoe up and they're like, oh, I can't say that because he's black. Oh, I can't say that because he's Asian. Oh, I can't say that because he's Hispanic. My test is the exact opposite. My test is, would I ridicule the fuck out of a white dude who did this? If the answer is yes, then I'm going to ridicule the fuck out of a black dude, a Hispanic guy, or an Asian dude who does the same thing. That's the truth. That's the truth. Take it to the bank. That's all I do. I love your grandma more than you. My name is Clay Travis. All right. Let's continue. Uh, additional questions or thoughts about the draft? Any questions out there? Um, any questions at all? Any questions? Uh, I, 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 black grandmas are off limits. No. Everybody's grandmas are on limits. I love all grandmas regardless of their of their color. I am the Martin Luther King of grandmas. I love grandmas more than anybody. That's true. I don't judge them by their color or their skin. I judge them by the content of their character. And the content of McKinley's character was suspect when he decided to walk out with a picture of his grandma and drop an F-bomb and a goddamn live on the show. Uh, second round. I would not draft... Uh, Joe Mixon, I have said that for a while. I anticipate that somebody probably in the second round will take a flyer on Joe Mixon. And I just hope for whatever team's sake that drafts him that there isn't suddenly and quickly a woman getting beat up in their city because that's the kind of thing that gets a GM fired. That's the kind of thing an owner doesn't recover from. That is the kind of thing why I would never do it because once you have that situation established, if it happens again, that's on you. You can't claim you didn't know. 
You can't claim he didn't know his history. That's the kind of thing that gets a GM and a president and probably a coach also potentially fired if they're not dominating. Um, okay, a uh, couple of additional thoughts. LeVar Ball. LeVar Ball has been turned down now by Under Armour, Nike, and Adidas because they do not agree with his decision on the big baller brand. Now, everybody out there who was like, oh, LeVar Ball is not costing his son, son any money, uh, you might want to take a re reconsideration. Now, if his son's really good, maybe the big baller brand can make some money. I'm going to tell you right now, I make hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, uh, over time, but I've also lost a ton of money on apparel. It's complicated to make a lot of money on apparel. And if Under Armour can't get people to buy the Steph Curry shoe, Steph Curry's a pretty good player, right? If Under Armour can't get people to buy the Steph Curry shoe, why is LeVar Ball going to get people to buy the, LeVar, the, the, uh, the Lonzo Ball shoe? I guarantee you he hasn't given any thought to simple things that really matter. Like, how do you make the shoe? How do you distribute the shoe nationwide? How do you get it into stores? How much are your shipping costs? Does the shoe look good? Does it work? You know, is it some cheap knockoff Chinese brand where everybody's tearing their ACLs and rolling up on their ankles? Is Lonzo Ball, the first time he starts in a game wearing the big baller brand shoe, going to have his leg break because the shoe's a total shit? Like, if you read Soul Influence, or sorry, Soul, Shoe Dog, sorry, Shoe Dog, the book by uh, Phil Knight, you would understand some of the complexities involved in trying to make and sell shoes nationwide, and it hasn't gotten any easier. So, LeVar Ball, questionable decision on his son's behalf. He has basically killed his marketability right now. And I don't think he has the ability to turn that into a positive by owning his own brand. People are like, oh, the man's going to own his own brand. He's going to be fine. All right, where's he going to get the shoes made? Where does his money come from to make shoes? Is he going to take out hundreds of thousands of dollars in investments and send it over to China to make a tennis shoe? This is a, a disastrous decision. Take it from somebody who spent... $50,000 on pants that I may, had made in China. When you're stroking a check for pants, you're like, oh, these are going to sell like hotcakes. If Steph Curry's shoe is not selling, why does LeVar Ball think that his shoe with Lonzo is going to sell? How many people out there are like, you know what, I have to have a Lonzo Ball shoe? Doesn't make any sense. Totally illogical. Absolutely absurd. I'm telling you, it's going to be a total bloodbath. And the likelihood is that Lonzo and LeVar Ball are going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars instead of just taking millions of dollars. Now, that also doesn't include the millions of dollars that you get spent on your behalf by Nike, Under Armour, or Adidas to make your brand more valuable. One of the big assets of signing with a big company like this is that as your brand grows, you sell more shoes, so they spend a lot of money advertising you. Print campaigns, television advertisements, all these other things that are insanely expensive. How is LeVar Ball going to market Lonzo? Is he just going to say crazy ass shit all the time? That's fine, by the way. One of my good friends from law school just sent me the link to the ESPN story and said, LeVar Ball equals Clay Travis. There is some LeVar Ball in me, right? There's no doubt. I just show up, I walk right in, I throw some grenades over my shoulder, and I keep walking as explosions happen all around me, all right? LeVar Ball is telling you exactly what he thinks, even if he's not quite necessarily always plugged in. Like people who criticize me, they're like, oh, Clay Travis just has so many opinions. How many opinions do I really have that have been proven wrong? I'm curious. On Facebook or uh, Twitter right now, how many people can point to opinions that I have had that are just completely wrong? I'm not talking about like predictions about who's going to win a game, right? That's pretty easy. Boogie Cousins getting arrested. I would still go double or nothing on Boogie Cousins getting arrested within five years. Okay, is that that big of an opinion that's wrong? So, I predicted that a multi-million dollar athlete was going to get arrested within five years. Is that really a ridiculous opinion? The arrest rate's pretty high. And Boogie Cousins definitely still is not behaving like a choir boy. All right? Like, so that's one. Anything else? I was wrong about Ronda Rousey, but then I was right later. My opinion was she could beat ass. And then I told you. I came right out and said, you know what? I was wrong. That's it. I mean, my opinion about selling pants was wrong. Well, that's a business opinion. Everybody makes bad decisions in business. If you make millions of dollars, sooner or later you also make a decision that costs you some money. Nobody's flawless in every business decision. Um, I was wrong about Trump won winning. That's just an opinion. You're right. I was wrong about Donald Trump winning the election, just, out at, just like everybody else. And I came on the show and I said I was wrong about Trump. I'm talking about big issues. 
Like, I'm mostly being proven right, right? Like ESPN. ESPN's imploding. Everybody suddenly is like, oh, what? You know what? Clay Travis, you're right. I'm talking to the New York Times and Politico today. They're both doing huge features on ESPN moving left wing and the business collapsing. Who's been telling you that that was happening on this show, even, for years? I'm pretty right. They're losing 10,000 customers a day. Everybody else just now starting to catch up. Who was right about Mizzou? Who was right about Ryan Lochte? Who was right about Peyton Manning? Like big stories, I tend to get right when everybody else is whiffing on them. That's just the truth. So by and large, LeVar Ball says all sorts of crazy shit. Most of my opinions aren't even that crazy. They're just right. 100%. Most of the time, I'm right about my opinion. Sometimes I'm wrong. When I'm wrong, I was wrong on Ronda Rousey. My opinion was wrong. I came out and I said, I bought into the fraud. I'm to blame. I come right out and own it. That's the difference between me and like Skip Bayless. Skip Bayless is going to go to his deathbed saying LeBron James sucks as a basketball player. I'm going to tell you the truth. I think he's the, one of the two best basketball players of all time. And I'll adjust my opinion as every game happens. So far, been pretty good. Okay. Uh, what, uh, what additional question? Bahamas. How about the fire event going on down in the Bahamas right now? A bunch of millennials decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to the Bahamas. We're going to stay in tents on the beach. And we're going to have an unbelievable festival. It's going to be very exclusive. It's going to be just like Coachella, except only rich people are going to go. They paid like $12,000 to go there. And it is a total disaster. I absolutely love seeing the pictures and the tweets from all these losers down there. It is hysterical. Absolutely hysterical what is going on down there. Go Google the FIRE event, F-Y-R-E, if you have the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to spend any time on it. You will absolutely love it. It is going to be extraordinary. I promise you. Go to F-Y-R-E, Google it. Uh, okay, let's move back into this rap rapid fire. Then I got to go pick up my kids at school. This has been, as always, a lot of fun. If you enjoy this show, go to Outkick the Coverage, my morning show from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Had a great week of shows. Uh, we are on nationwide, 250 stations. If you're listening to this right now, we are adding a ton of affiliates. Mike and Mike is quitting, and we are adding a ton of affiliates all over the country. We're adding like 15 in the next couple of months, 15 more radio stations, huge percentage gain. The most recent to flip, uh, Greenville, South Carolina, and Columbia, South Carolina, starting on Monday. If you are in the state of South Carolina, we will be on all over the state and we will now be on in Greenville, South Carolina, which is a big market for us, huge college football town, and also Columbia, South Carolina, where the University of South Carolina is. So both of those locations, we will be on AM stations there in the 1400 range. Uh, obviously, we're on Sirius XM Channel 83, 250 and change, moving up towards 260 or 270. Okay, um, additional questions from you guys. Are the Preds going to win the Cup? By the way, let me hit on this Pred story. I don't know how many of you read the mailbag this morning, but I wrote about this in the mailbag because I kind of kept up on it. The St. Louis Brew, uh, Blues like tweeted something and then some St. Louis Blues fan was like, not only did we lose, we lost to the black guy talking about P.K. Saban and they decided it was racist and then everybody went out and they doxed the guy and he lost his job and all this stuff. And I wrote about it this morning. And my thought on that is pretty straightforward. Like we definitely have gotten all twisted astray about what's actually racist. Why is that racist? Let me put it in this context. If Gordon Hayward hits a shot tonight to eliminate the LA Clippers and the Clippers text like, oh, great season, appreciate all the Clippers support, and some black guy goes on and says, damn, not only did we lose, but a white dude beat the crap out of us and drained the jumper on us, that gets retweeted hundreds of times and everybody thinks it's funny. Because the joke there is not at the expense of the race. It's at the expense of your team, right? Black guys are better at basketball than white guys. Oh my God, did Clay Travis really say that? Yeah, I really fucking did. Black people are better at basketball than white people. If you want to argue with that, then I would suggest that there's huge discrimination going on because otherwise there should be tons of white people who are playing in the NBA. That's just true. Like, that's not racist to say. That's a true fact based on ample evidence in the NBA right now. White people appear to be better at hockey than black people. Now, we're a little bit uncertain about that because I don't know how many black people actually play hockey. It's possible that if black people played hockey at the same rate that they play basketball, that black people would actually be incredible at hockey. I don't know. I don't know anything about hockey at all, right? But the joke there is that somebody who's typically not very good at a sport 
ends up beating your team, that's how shitty they were, right? It's not racist. It's not necessarily that funny of a joke. But if Gordon Hayward hits a jumper tonight in Game 6 to beat the Clippers and the Clippers get a tweet sent to them and it says, damn, we let the white boy roast us and it's a black dude who says it, then nobody's going to be like, oh my God, that's so racist. So the Clippers losing to a white dude is like the Blues losing to a black dude in hockey. It's not an insult against P.K. Saban. It's just saying this guy is black and he beat us. That's how bad we played. We lost to a black hockey player. All right? I don't understand how racist that is or why it's even considered remotely racist. Same thing would be true in other races, right? When Lynn's sanity was going on and the Knicks were winning all these games and nobody could stop Jeremy Lynn. Are you telling me there weren't tons of black dudes out there ridiculing their team when the Knicks won? Being like, man, not only do the the Trailblazers suck so bad, we got beat by an Asian point guard. That's an insult of the Trailblazers, not the Asian point guard. You can't even beat a team with an Asian point guard, right? So that 100% is not racist. So this guy ends up losing his job over that tweet. Now I think it's a stupid tweet. I don't think it's particularly funny. But I understand what he's going for and it's not racism. That's not the goal. The goal is to ridicule the Blues for losing that game. So how does it happen? The Blues respond, racism is never right. Don't come and tweet us things like this, which is like the ultimate social justice warrior response, right? All the Blues had to do was block the guy or just not respond to the comment and nobody would have really noticed. I don't know why they needed to dox him and come out publicly and be like, this is totally unacceptable. We're anti-racism. You know what I assume? That every fucking professional sports franchise is anti-racism. That would would really surprise me if a pro sports franchise in 2017 in America came out and said, you know what? We kind of hate Hispanic people. You know what? The Columbia Fireflies, this place where uh, where Tim Tebow's playing right now, if I saw a tweet from the Columbia Fireflies and it was like, you know what? We don't want Asian people to come watch Tim Tebow play because really we're not big fans of the Asians or actually it would be Orientals, right? That I'd be like, ooh, holy fuck, I didn't expect that. Didn't expect for, the, for, for a minor league baseball team to come out against the Asian people. That was a big surprise. A, a professional sports team that says we're anti-racism, you can't say anything less significant than that. There's absolutely nothing of any substance behind that. And so I would encourage you guys, when race is mentioned, it doesn't mean that something's racist. The reason why race relations are as bad as they are in this country right now is because everybody, two things. One, white people are the only people who can be racist. Mainstream media, you talk to mainstream media, the only racism that exists in America is white to black. Everything else doesn't exist, right? It's lazy, it's stupid. Everybody can have people who are racist in their race. And in fact, everybody does. And I would even take it a step further and say that racism is probably roughly equal, right? Same number of black racists as white racists, same number of Asian racists as a percentage of the population as black and white and Hispanic and everything else. I'm so crazy that I think that racism is roughly equal across all of the span of races in this country. I know, it's a ridiculous idea. Two, whenever anybody says anything other than racism is bad that references race in any way, people are like, oh my God, I can't believe they said that. It's totally broken. It's unbelievable. Like me saying, black people are better at basketball than white people. Some people will be like, oh my God, you know what Clay Travis said today? He said black people are better at basketball than white people. And guess what? They're also better at football. Unless you were watching the draft last night, there were a lot more black dudes getting drafted in the first round than white people. Now, unless you believe that discrimination is rampant and white people are being discriminated against, you have to come to an idea that in meritocracy in a modern American society, the best people get drafted into the NFL. And if the best people get drafted into the NFL, it's not racist that it happens to end up being black dudes. Black people are better at football and they're better at basketball than everybody else in America as a percentage of their population. In fact, if you factor in the percentage of the population, it gets even more insane. Black people are only 12% of the United States population. So the fact that they represent 90% or whatever it was, 85% of the first round draft picks last night is even more insane. Because there's actually five times as many of us boring ass white dudes as there are black guys. So they are out representing us like eight to one despite the fact that we outpopulate them five to one. It's a ridiculous situation. So it's not racist to point that out. That's just a fact. Anyway, what can I say? I'm the Martin Luther King of the American sports media. I am Clay Travis. Any questions? I got to go pick up my kids at school. Uh, let's go uh, Trubisky's tweet I absolutely love that Trubisky said I love titties Uh, that makes two of us Mitch Trubisky he then deleted it he spelled titties with two S's which I guess means he loves titties even more than just tits Uh, that was fantastic 
Again, I've said this for a long time. I'm not racist. I hate everyone equally. It's about as honest as you can possibly be. Barnett will be good. Um, I love all of you. Thank you for coming to hang out with me. The podcast is now updating. We had a little bit of a glitch on Outkick the Show. It is now updating every day. Go subscribe to the podcast if you're not watching this live. I would also encourage you guys to go uh, listen to Outkick the Coverage. Again, we're adding Greenville, South Carolina and Columbia, South Carolina. Big markets. More coming soon. We are dominating. As I said this morning in response to a hater, bitch, I own the mornings and that remains true. 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern, I am Clay Travis. I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend and whatever you do, remember, hashtag DBAP. Don't be a pussy and don't take your grandmother's picture out to the bar with you tonight. Although if you do, send me a picture and I'll tweet it out. I would love to see people rolling out to the bar tonight with pictures of their grandmother. I told my grandmother, you know what I told her? Right before she died, I said, Grandma, I'm going to go chase pussy and I'm going to bring your picture with me. I'd love to see your picture with you at the bar. I'm Clay Travis, DBAP. I'll see you guys, maybe over the weekend, if not, on Monday. Have great weekends. Love you. Outkick. The show is out!